Why is it so hard for women to find an outfit that fits? Just two words for you: standardized sizing. Hi there, everyone. It's Jeff, and yes, we are venturing into unfamiliar territory for me. Not just the fashion world, but the women's fashion world. All I can say is, I learned a lot preparing this episode. And I hope you learn a lot listening. You might learn about the fashion world, but you might already know this stuff. The good news is you can listen to it in English, learn to talk about it in English, and that's the great thing about plain English. You get exposure to lots of different topics in your new language, and it's all at the speed that you can understand. If you're new to plain English, Here's how it works. Every episode has a number. This is number seven zero nine, and if you go to plainenglish.com/slash seven zero nine, you'll get the full lesson with quizzes, activities, translations, and the fast audio version of this very episode. Every plain English episode has a story and. An expression. Today's story is about the tyranny of standardized sizing in women's outfits. The expression is "in touch." Before we start today's story, I just like to remind you that the podcast is just one part of how we can help you upgrade your English skills. At PlainEnglish.com, you can make faster progress. With active learning strategies, you can take quizzes, do activities, listen to the fast version of the audio, watch video workshops, practice what you learn, and even join a live call with Jr. and me. It's all about helping you build your skills to become a better, more confident English speaker. Sound good? Go to plainenglish.com. To start your free 14-day trial today, now let's jump into today's story. Generations ago, women who wanted a new dress went to a seamstress. The seamstress would take careful, detailed measurements and create a dress. That fit the customer's body perfectly. That might sound like a dream today, but there were serious limitations to the old approach. It was much more expensive. It took a long time, and customers were limited to the fabrics and talents available where they lived. The fashion industry. Has standardized, and today most customers buy their clothes off the rack. Few people would want to go back to the old way of getting clothes. But one consequence of standardization is that women have limited choices in sizes. The specifics vary by country, but one truth. Is the same almost everywhere. Every female customer must boil her whole body down to just a single number, the standardized size. In the U.S., women's dress sizes are available in even number increments from double zero, petite, to twenty-two. With the majority of women fitting between a size two and sixteen, but two women who both wear, say, size eight, may have much different proportions. So a size eight might be the right choice for both, but the same garment would fit them very differently. To make matters more confusing, a size eight at one brand isn't the same 
as a size 8 at another brand. Even within one brand, sizing may not be consistent across different product lines. Here's why. Fashion designers for retail stores typically work with a fit model for each line of clothing. The fit model is the size and demographic of the target customer of that product. Most luxury fashion brands pick a size 6 model of approximately the same age as the target customer. They design a size 6 for that model's body. The designs are very detailed. They include much more than just the standard measurements. Designers control the size of the armholes, the tightness of shoulder seams, the height of the waistline, and dozens more smaller fit decisions. Once they have the perfect fit for their fit model, they adjust the measurements up and down for the other sizes. Here's what that means. If a brand designs a product for a size 6 fit model, then that's it. There is no size 8 fit model. There is no size 10 fit model. To design the size 8, they just take the size 6 measurements and tweak them. To design the size 10, they tweak them even more. So the farther a garment's size is from the fit model size, up or down, the more removed that garment is from a real human's body. So if you happen to have a similar body to the fit model, you're in luck. But here's a depressing stat. One industry study looked at 657 different women and found only nine had measurements similar to the fit model. That's about 1.4%. Okay, but let's say you did the hard work and found the right size for you in each of your favorite stores. Is your job done? Not exactly. You see, a size 8 in one year isn't the same as a size 8 in another year, even at the same store. Fashion analysts point to something called vanity sizing. A size 6 woman who gets a little bigger can still wear a size 6 as she gets older because the size 6 is getting bigger. So standardized sizing might be a misnomer. There doesn't seem to be much standard about it. The confusion has real consequences. First, customers find it difficult to find an outfit that fits well. So millions, if not billions, of women are walking around in clothing that doesn't fit their body the way they'd like it to. And with the advent of online shopping, returns carry a real economic and environmental cost. About a fifth of online clothing purchases are returned and 90% of returns are related to fit and sizing. So what can be done to create a better fit? There are a few unsatisfying proposals. Some people think brands should follow strict size guidelines so that an 8 at one store would be an 8 at every other store. 
But designers and industry analysts say this would make the problem worse. At least today's confused and varied sizing lets women find a brand and size combination that fits them well. More standardization in sizing would remove a lot of the options in the market. It would work great for the minority of people who fit that standard size perfectly, but not at all for the majority who are a bit different. The other option is to move to sizing that takes into account multiple measurements. This makes sense, right? Why should women have to summarize their entire bodies in just a single number? For women, the three most important measurements to get a good fit are bust, waist, and hip. But there are downsides to making outfits based on three measurements instead of just one measurement. Brands would have to contend with a much larger variety of sizes. Now, they might make one piece in 10 or 12 sizes. But if they moved to sizing based on multiple measurements, they'd have to make 30, 50, or more different size combinations. It would be a nightmare to manage the inventory. They wouldn't have a good idea of how much to make of each size with so many different size combinations. There would be fewer returns, yes, but there would probably be more total waste in the system as many garments would go unsold, and that would lead to higher costs. And consumers like lower prices. There is a silver lining. New, more flexible fabrics give women and men more flexibility in finding the right fit. If an outfit would be tight in just one of your measurements, now the fabric can flex a little so you don't have to go up an entire size. In the old days of the shopping mall, you might only have five, six, seven stores to choose from. You were at their mercy, and most of them had the same brand image, tyranny. But now, online brands can target their own markets, have fit models of different sizes, so that they can make clothes that fit better. Plus, I think data science, cameras, and better imaging should all help. A brand called Laws of Motion offers a dress in 99 sizes. So you can take a few photos, fill out a questionnaire, and get a precision size based on multiple measurements. I like that. In touch. To be in touch is a phrase that most often means to stay in contact with someone or to maintain communication with someone. When you say you'll be in touch with someone, you're promising to keep talking or communicating in the future. That's the most common way to use it. But in touch can also mean being aware of or connected to something. Let's start with staying in contact. To be in touch is all about communication. It doesn't have to be talking. It can be through phone calls, emails, texts, or face-to-face meetings. We often use in touch when we want to make sure that a relationship 
or a connection continues, even if we are not seeing the person every day. Now, that's important. You wouldn't say to your husband or wife, we'll be in touch. Presumably, you see each other or talk to each other every day. You use in touch with people that you don't see every day. To be in touch means to make an intentional effort to stay connected. So imagine you've just had a great meeting with a potential business partner. At the end of the conversation, you might say, let's be in touch. This simple phrase is a way of saying that you want to continue the conversation, to keep the lines of communication open. It's an informal but polite way of saying that you'll reconnect in the future. You'll be in touch. You'll talk again. You can also use to be in touch with friends and family. Let's say you run into an old friend from high school. You have a quick chat, and just before parting ways, you might say, We should stay in touch. That means you're interested in keeping the friendship going, making an effort to stay connected, even though you hadn't been in touch for a while. You might say, We haven't been in touch for many years. Then we reconnected and we've stayed in touch ever since. After a job interview, a recruiter might tell a candidate, we'll be in touch. That's a professional way of saying that the company will contact the candidate with more information or a final decision. It's a polite, neutral phrase that keeps the candidate informed without making any promises about a decision. Someone might ask you, are you still in touch with your old boss? Or do you keep in touch with your old boss? These questions are a way of asking whether you still communicate with a former employer. Staying in touch with a former boss might involve occasional emails, text messages, LinkedIn messages, or even meeting up for coffee or lunch from time to time. That all counts as staying in touch. In all these cases, the big idea is the same. To be in touch means you're keeping the door open for future communication. Whether you're making a new friend, continuing a business relationship, or simply trying to keep up with someone you care about, saying, let's be in touch, is a simple, effective way to make sure that the relationship continues. Now, there are two other ways to use in touch, but they're less common. So here we go. To be in touch with can mean to be aware of or informed about a particular topic. For example, you might say, she's really in touch with the latest fashion trends. That means she's nothing like me. Actually, it means she knows what's currently popular and fashionable. She reads the magazines, peruses the blogs, watches videos, goes to shows, talks to designers. She knows what's going on. She's in touch with what's happening in the fashion world. And then finally, to be in touch can also refer to being emotionally aware or connected, either to yourself or to others. It's common to say someone is in touch with their emotions. Or, let's be honest, maybe it's more common to say someone is not in touch with their emotions. 
If you're in touch with your emotions, you understand, think about, and acknowledge your feelings. You might say that someone is in touch with his creative self, and that means the person is aware of or connected to his own creativity, like that. Well, congratulations on being in touch with your bilingual self or your trilingual self for some of you. And great job on making it to the end of another Plain English episode. This was number 709. So that means the full lesson content is available at plainenglish.com slash 709. That is thanks to JR, the producer. I hope you enjoyed this first of our three, maybe it will be four episodes on fashion. The next one is next week. We'll be asking whether men really need to wear ties anymore. Big debate. Wait till you hear it. That's next week on Plain English. See you then. Listen up. If you speak Spanish, Portuguese, Chinese, German, French, Italian, Japanese, Polish, or Turkish. One of the most frustrating things about listening and reading in a second language is being confused by unfamiliar words or phrases. When you listen to plain English or when you read the transcript, you probably encounter some words you don't know. When that happens, you have a few options. You can stop the audio Go look up the definition, then return to the episode, find your place, and press play again, but that's exhausting. Or you can just skip it and be confused. That's no fun either. But what if you could see the translation of the word into your language instantly without having to stop the audio? without having to look anything up? Well, you can at plainenglish.com. For each episode, we translate about 100 words and phrases from English to nine languages, Spanish, Portuguese, Chinese, German, French, Italian, Japanese, Polish, and Turkish and we highlight those words in blue. All you have to do is hover your mouse over the highlighted word, and you'll see the translation instantly. It works great on mobile, too. It really makes listening a lot more satisfying, and it's a great way to expand your vocabulary in English. The best way to see these translations is to sign up for a free 14-day trial at plainenglish.com. During your trial, you can read as many transcripts as you like, all with the translations into your language. So sign up for your free trial today at plainenglish.com.